The Future Sport Podcast is brought to you by 3Advance, developers of sports tech apps that are AI-powered and UX-focused. So if you're looking to create some apps for your startup or your sports biz calls for some artificial or business intelligence, you should check out 3Advance. They're incredible. Go to 3Advance.com. That's the number 3Advance.com. Empire. The traditional media, they're not only dealing with technology, but changing tastes in sports. Sort of every two to three years, you see a sea change in the lineup of talent. And I, I guess in that realm, then you, you either fall in love with the player or you fall in love with the team. But they're, they're, one with, they're not one of the same anymore. That's David Gal, chairman and CEO of Gal Media, which includes the SB Nation radio network. They're toggling between being tech forward and serving the existing audience. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. David Gao is also building innovation maps, which stemmed out of the budding tech hub in his home base of Houston, Texas. Got a lot of surprises to share when we speak with him. Plus, let's give a little new school thought to signing up your kids for leagues. Alex Alt at Stack Sports is revolutionizing that process. But first, the old school gets a new school investment because the future is now. So in the content rights deals, everyone who is anyone says, well, when one of the big boys jumps in, that's when things are going to change. It's happened recently when Amazon bought a piece of the Yankees television network, the Yes Network. Carrie Flynn covered the story for CNN and joins us now. Hey, Carrie, how are you? Hi, good. Thanks for having me on. I don't think it's a surprise that Amazon is getting into sports. They did it with the NFL, but this seems like a landscape shifting type of purchase by them and could be something that we might see more of in the future, right? Definitely. I've been keeping my eyes on the well, general intersection of sports and tech and, and streaming rights moving to more modern platforms that, you know, people my age really are the only way is people who are cord cutters, the way they, they watch live sports and so amazon has slowly been stepping into getting these rights similar to facebook and twitter like you said they had the nfl thursday night football deal they got i believe they've had it for three years now this is their third year and then recently they secured some of the rights to the yes network which is most popularly known for having rights to the yankees It's an interesting purchase for them. This is a landmark property, one of the most recognized properties around the world. And it's an interesting space for them to really test their reach, right? Definitely. I I think one thing that's obviously, I I mean, I got to admit, I'm a Red Sox fan. Hmm. So writing this this news story and covering this has been a little awkward for me. But the Yankees are huge. And and the Yes Network also has other New York teams like the Brooklyn Nets. And one thing that's just special about the Yankees is that they're like a global brand. You know, like people everywhere are interested in the Yankees. And and that's kind of Amazon's play, right? Is, Is there this global network where they're like, if we can bring the ability for people outside of the New York area to, to watch the Yankees, then that's, that's great for all everyone, the Yankees and for Amazon. You know, what will be interesting here, too, is that if Amazon is going to be directly involved in the presentation, right? Because here's a team and a product that has traditionally showcased its product in a very specific way for a very long time, and here comes the new school provider – who can offer a variety of different outlets to them and a variety of different packages. And I wonder how Amazon's going to deal with this. Yeah, they unfortunately won't say. Um, we can start to see what they've been doing with the NFL. They have a right to a few other uh, sports networks as well. They were the exclusive partner this year for the U.S. Open for the U.K. streaming. So we're starting to see kind of how they present sports. And one thing they've done is is have kind of – different anchors uh, leading the broadcast. One thing they boast about in their NFL coverage is they have an all, like, female, quote-unquote, like, cast uh, broadcasting those games. 
for uh, soccer, football in the UK, they have they'll they'll stream. Uh, they have two soccer like hosts talk about NFL football. It's just kind of they're like more gimmicky and fun about it. Really, unlike the traditional sports broadcast you see at ESPN. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what they would do with baseball, a sport that has kind of needed a more like modern twist to it these days. Yep, and we'll see who else they're going to buy because they can buy anybody they want. Carrie Flynn uh, from <laughs> CNN. Like, money is not an option. <laughs> so I think it's not an obstacle, but I think what's interesting, though, is, is Amazon tr- has tried to secure more rights, and they haven't always won. Uh, for instance, Sinclair beat them out for another uh, 21 21- it was there was up for grabs 22 regional sports networks they got the yes network but they lost out on those 21 to sinclair and i was told that they actually offered more money so at the same time you know the the owners of sports rights are, aren't necessarily money isn't always what they're after they also want a good partner so you know it's up to amazon to be able to prove that as well carrie flynn from cnn thanks for joining us thanks for having me up next, David Gal, chairman and CEO of Gal Media on the fractured media landscape. This is the Future Sport Podcast. The future of the media landscape, it's a tough call across the board. How, where, what devices, which platforms win rights, how are games presented? It's a media wild west right now. And one that our guest David Gal, the chairman and CEO of Gal Media, is navigating daily. Gal Media owns several media properties, including the SB Nation Radio Network and Innovation Map, which we'll get into in a moment. It's a new vertical that focuses on exactly the type of content that we are doing here. And in full disclosure, I do host a weekly show centered on the high levels of thoroughbred horse racing called The Winter Circle, which does air on SB Nation Radio. Hi, David. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you, Bram. It's great to be here. Um, let's start with tech before we get into the, the industry as, as a whole. Innovation Map, what is it? Why did you start it? So a little history on our company. As you mentioned, we own SB Nation Radio and a local sports station in Houston, And three years ago, we were just committed to sports radio. But then we had a chance to buy an entity called CultureMap.com. And CultureMap is the leading online destination for lifestyle content across the state of Texas. So CultureMap covers food, fun, restaurants, events, society, arts, travel, music, et cetera. And it was great to own CultureMap and live at the intersection of sports and culture. But a little bit after that, we realized, gosh, we've got all these sports guys in our building, all these sports experts, many of whom are branded in town, and we own Culture Map, this great digital platform. We really needed to launch a second content site that we did called Sports Map. And so we landed with Sports Map and Culture Map, and we were in a good space, the intersection of sports and culture, radio and digital, and happy to be there. Well, and about that time, we met with lots of city leaders here in Houston who were sort of frustrated that, well, when Amazon was looking for its second headquarter location, Amazon didn't think much of Houston. They didn't view Houston as a home of innovation and entrepreneurialism. And so the city fathers, the mayor's office, Greater Houston Partnership, they formed a group called Houston Exponential to try to figure out the next wave of exponential growth. And one of the key attributes to having and really fostering innovation in a marketplace was a media outlet to tell the stories. And so we felt that having a media outlet would really enhance innovation in the city. And so working with lots of leading companies in the city, we've launched our third content map, our third content category online, which is called Innovation Map. So we now have Culture Map, Sports Map, and Innovation Map all under a common map brand. Tell me a little bit about what is happening in Houston. What is what is happening there that people don't know about? So what's happening that's really exciting is this has always been a city that has had lots of entrepreneurial activity and particularly great excellence and innovation in the energy and in the medical arenas. But the city is really working on rounding out and organizing lots of the entrepreneurial activity. 
So we are working hard at taking or creating innovation hubs in different parts of the cities. And these innovation hubs are the product of a collaboration of leading universities like Rice University. One is the, the efforts of University of Houston. So you've got the universities involved. You've got city leaders involved. Certainly some large corporations like Accenture and BBVA Bank are backing and sponsoring these innovation hubs. And they're coming places where businesses can or entrepreneurial ventures can co-locate, get mentoring, receive shared services, go through accelerator programs, and really take their businesses to another level. Has this always been there and people were not aware of it, or has this been a, a new wave where people have come to Houston to collaborate together? So I think that what's happened historically is we've always had great entrepreneurial activity, but they were more independent efforts, and they, success was sort of the product of lots of individual excellent leaders and innovators. Now what's happened is the city, in a very deliberate, strategic way, is aligning people's efforts so there are some foundational hubs that are enablers that will probably raise the likelihood of success. So, yes, it's always been here, entrepreneurialism and innovation, and certainly in some sectors, but now uh, there are really good disciplines being in place and resources being put in place that will raise the probability of success. Um, do you look at Innovation Map as something that's going to be replicated with other markets or other regions of the country or the world? So right now at Gal Media, culturemap.com is in the five cities of Texas. Innovation Map is only in Houston. We've launched it in Houston. It was a great market for us to launch. It's our home market. But, yeah, I think there's a great opportunity for us to take Innovation Map, which is only in Houston, and at least go to the other cities where Culture Map already is, where we already have a team of people there, where there are both editorial team members and sales team members. So the least, yes, we could envision rolling Innovation Map out in other cities in Texas. Uh, let me get your thoughts on some of the specific tech that's in sports right now. What are you following that you're most interested in? So let me tell you that one thing I find really interesting and it's sort of fun we're visiting about this today is that in Houston we've long been known as a leader one well, innovative leader in medical and an innovative leader in energy there's now uh, an emerging thought that what we're doing with these innovation hubs and these co-location of entrepreneurial ventures is a very good thing but we are planting a thousand flowers spread out over lots of different industries and there's a risk that those seeds won't really take root and grow up in big, mature companies unless we provide a little bit more of an industry focus, unless we co-locate resources in a particular area. That, that perhaps when you look backward, one of the reasons why we've done so well in energy and medical is because there was such a concentration of resources, people, talent, energy, investment, et cetera. So the city and all these activities that we've got and these various innovation hubs that are launching around the city, the city is looking at what is a third leg on the stool? What can we go from energy to medical and to now a third arena? And the arena that everyone's pretty amped up about where we think Houston can really make a mark, where we might collect a lot of resources and really grow up is sports tech. And we think sports tech is a great fit for us given a lot of attributes of the city. And so there's likely to be a, a big thrust for making sports tech a home uh, or making Houston really maybe a global leader in the sports tech marketplace. You have a really interesting background too, degrees in economics. You, you've worked as a top level strategist for compact computers. Here you are running a, a media operation. Um, how did those experiences kind of shape your vision of tech and its role in content with the media? Well, it is funny as you say that because I was at Compact Computers and I was an early stage employee and investor in a dot com at the height of e-commerce or the growth of e-commerce. So I used to be viewed in town as a techie, particularly in an industry okay. or a city that didn't have a lot of tech back in the 90s. And so I was a techie then. I was in all these new technologies. And then I got into radio, which everybody looked at as sort of old media. And so it's fun to cycle back and now be in digital media and have those properties and really use social media to drive our digital platforms. So, yes, I mean, clearly uh, one of the key things that have happened has happened in media over the last 
10 years is that viewership audiences, they are consuming media through different platforms. And it's just imperative that we find ways to reach those audiences where the eyeballs already are. Um, let's talk about radio and audio for a moment with you. How are people going to consume audio in the next five to 10 years? So they're going to consume audio, but the platforms will be different. You know what? It's so funny you raised this point with my history at Compaq. When I was at Compaq Computers, we were selling PCs. We were the largest PC manufacturer in the world. And at that time, Compaq sold nearly every one of its PCs through a, a distribution platform, through a distribution partner, some kind of reseller. And then along came Dell, and Dell had a direct-to-the-consumer model or direct-to-the-customer model, and that caused angst and really put Compaq at a supply chain disadvantage. Clearly, Compaq's right response was, okay, we're going to manufacture PCs, and we're going to sell PCs in every possible distribution platform so that our PCs are available to the buyer wherever the buyer wants to consume it. And that's really what we're trying to do with audio. Audio is going to be consumed. The question is, on what platform? And really, it's very easy to add additional platforms. So we're taking our shows, like Espination Radio shows, we are distributing them over our own radio station, over other people's radio stations, over satellite radio, over mobile devices, over web streaming that is our own website, and over other people's websites. So the chance, really, on the one hand, you can say, oh, this is negative because radio won't have the same share of voice that it used to have. But if you believe in audio, the opportunity is now audio can be consumed in many, many different platforms. Or, well, look at the uh, Alexa devices in everybody's homes. That's another one. There are many, many more ways for us as a creator of audio content to connect to audiences because the distribution platforms have grown so significantly. Uh, do you envision that there's a Netflix Hulu of audio that's out there? Because here we are doing this podcast, and we're going to promote it, and we're going to tell you to go to 18 different places to potentially listen to it. Uh, it would yep. be so much easier if we could tell somebody, here's where you go to get the quality programs, and oh, by the way, the algorithm is following you and knows what you like and is going to make these um, options for you and available. Well, that's a good analogy, and I suspect, yes, there'll be some leaders for leading platforms for distribution like that. I mean, I, I suppose iTunes is certainly a candidate, and but I, I think one great, great thing about podcasts and audio consumption is how easy it is to distribute, how well you don't have to have a, a cable wire into your home, which somebody needed for a long time to do uh, TV watching, uh, you can, it's a very, very accessible, easy media, and that creates lots of avenues to the consumer. Um, let's get into some content plays here. Gambling's legalization. How do you view that in terms of sports programming? The separation between sports talk and gambling talk, I think, will diminish over time. I mean, we've already seen it, right? Most of our show hosts, at some point, as they're talking about a big game coming up, touch on the lines, what the spreads are going in, because it's a part of the narrative. In fact, it's sort of an interesting angle of the discussion. Uh, when AD, Anthony Davis, gets traded to the Lakers, and the Lakers are suddenly now the favorites to win the NBA title next year, that's an amazing swing that just shows how valuable he is. And so, yes, I think that the vernacular of gambling – all of those discussions are going to be woven into sports talk. They're just going to be endemic there. And I don't think that uh, there's a, going to be a huge separation of church and state anymore. I think it's going to become more of a blend. Um, and I know this is a bit out of the realm, but maybe it falls into audio as well. There's a lot of discussion of what the second screen experience is going to be. So I wonder how you envision how the leagues and their partners are going to deal with the same event with multiple options to the viewer. The league and everybody's just going to have to accept this is coming, right? I mean, there's so many things when technology gets out, you just can't hold back. And the whole fan engagement frontier is really exciting. I mean, you can even get to the leagues. Well, I know that the Texans want to sell out their stadium every year, every game, but I'm sure there are going to be increasing numbers of technologies that will make the fan engagement experience at home so rich 
it'll be even harder to get up off that couch where you're having a great experience, maybe watching double screens and maybe watching on a hologram, maybe getting to decide which version of the replay you want to watch. All the empowerment of the consumer back home and the fan engagement at home, in some sense, does undermine the ability to sell tickets at the stadium. And I, but I don't think, I mean, the genie's out of the bottle. These technologies are coming and it may just be that everybody consumes those athletic games a little bit differently. Yeah, and we're hearing from more and more people that build these stadiums. They're becoming entertainment hubs, um, let alone yep. something that showcases a game. So it's going to be interesting to see how the stadium um, changes its model for how they want to attract people um, in there beyond just what's happening in front of them on the field or the court. Um, last it's, almost, one on, it's an imperative to do so. Yeah. You know, yep. um, last one for you on content. Esports, because, listen, gambling marries well with the things that we do as broadcasters in sports already and and so now that the genie's out of the bottle we can kind of talk about it more freely than we have in the past esports is very different in terms of a content play so how do you see that kind of falling into the media landscape oh goodness i the esports thing is almost comical to me i'm just blown away how rapidly it has grown and i've got an investment in a company that is up right at the cutting edge of holding big esports tournaments and is doing a great job. It's called Mainline, and they've just demonstrated to me or opened my eyes to what a significant thing esports is going to be. We don't talk about it much on the air. It almost feels like a different audience, but I may be naive about that. I really don't know what to do in terms of commenting on esports. I mean, I guess the day could well come well, you know, universities are giving scholarships to esports players, so the day could come where we would be talking about how the Longhorns beat the Sooners in esports. Um, but I, I just, I'm left to speculate and scratch my head on that one. That that day is probably coming. It's just uh, esports has always been ahead of my own personal imagination. Just. It's been racing way ahead of what I could envision esports would be. Yeah, I agree. I, I'm a full believer in the business model of it. I, but from, from what we do and what we're talking about here as for a living, um, it doesn't seem to fall into the category of the same audience. So I'm, I'm at a loss with it, too, that I don't know what happens with it as you try to present it. But in that regard, with we're talking about kind of old school fans and new school fans. I, I wonder if you think the definition of being a fan has changed through the years. Well, one thing I definitely feel is that I grew up in an era where I really, really, really rooted for teams, and my kids often root for the team that they created through fantasy. So they may, if it's a team I don't care about, late on a Sunday I might not even watch the game, but they're going to stay and continue to watch because they've got one of their fantasy players on that late game. And so, yes, that's one thing. Team allegiance is less than it used to be. I think mean, it's lighter than it used to be uh, because of fantasy sports, which effectively dismembers the NFL team and creates an independent team that's an amalgamation of players across the league. So that's sort of an interesting change for sure. And then I guess when we get to a more migrant landscape, I mean, people, it's, I guess the other thing I would say, yes, people move around more and players move around more. So, uh, free agency is such a dynamic that didn't exist 20, 30 years ago in the NFL. It's such a big, but, and look at the NBA. I mean, the, it's going to be a big reshuffling of the deck and it happens sort of every two to three years. You see a sea change in the lineup of talent. And I, I guess in that realm, then you, you either fall in love with the player or you fall in love with the team, but they're, they're one of the, they're not one of the same anymore. Uh, People are bouncing around much more, and that, that's a, definitely a, a, a different element to the landscape today. Yeah, and the globalization, too. I, like We're talking mm-hmm. to people who are, who are connecting fans all over the world, and they're stopping calling the Golden State Warriors the Golden State Warriors. They're calling them the Warriors because mm-hmm. I, I, the, the regionality mm-hmm. of the idea of a team that has a regional aspect to it because it's locally based, that, that almost doesn't apply any longer. Yep, yep. Um, all right, I'll let you go with this. Um, last thing for you, and, and um, you know, we've talked a lot about kind of the splintered nature of, of what this is, the media landscape right now, and, and there's new fans that are following things that don't seem to fall under the purview, and the content is changing, and people are trying to find all of this stuff. Do you think the Amazons and Googles of the world are going to own everything in sports one day? 
<laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I've learned not to sell them short. <laughs> I can remember when Amazon was just going, well, Amazon started just a, an e-tailer of books. And then they decided, well, well, they'll have a second product category called toys. And then they did auctions. But at that point, they were just going to be a category seller of different categories. And they were there was never this notion that we're going to own the whole e-commerce landscape and be the grand enabler of all e-commerce transactions, which is sort of where they've been headed. So, no, I, I think that um, they have an opportunity to be at least a significant distribution hub for lots of content. And that puts them right in the heart of sports landscape and they're going to find a way to make some money out of it. Yeah, I, I never thought I'd go buy a piece of salmon at Whole Foods and be able, with a click of a button, by buying the salmon, get a bookcase, too. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> right? who knew? Uh, David yep. Gao is the chairman and the CEO of Gal Media. Thank you so much, David. Thanks. Great to be with you. Up next, the way we can get our kids active and in the leagues they want, that's changing. Alex Alt, CEO of Stack Sports, shows the way. This is the Future Sport Podcast. So let's take a minute here to thank our friends at 3 Advance. These guys are ranked one of the nation's top app developers, but that's not all. They've helped grow a bunch of sports tech startups like Team Builder, T-Box Tour, and In-Game Fantasy. But they're also experts in user experience, cloud APIs, and artificial intelligence. So if you're looking for a dev partner to bring your future sport tech to life, look these guys up. Go to 3advance.com. They're the team to make it happen. At Advance, you will. That's the number 3advance.com. And tell them Future Sport sent you. Can software help your team win? Our guest this week, Alex Alt, is pretty sure of it. He's the CEO of Stack Sports, and he joins us now. Hey, Alex, how are you? Doing well. How are you, Bram? All right, I'm one of the laymen, so you got to help me out here. What kind of solutions do you provide to sports teams and leagues? Yeah, we provide a whole host of solutions, uh, and I'll, I'll describe it. Think of like a... Think of like a bullseye with a few rings around the bullseye. And if you think about Stack Sports, our bullseye and, and the core of our business is really around uh, registration, payment, and league management. You know, we believe that you know, all sports and particularly youth participation in sports starts when you sign up to be a part of a, a team or a club. And, uh, and we create solutions and our core is really the solutions that facilitate that, that registration. And then subsequently allows administrators and coaches to manage that team throughout a course of, throughout a course of the season. Uh, so if you think about the core of the bullseye being registration league, and I'll also throw in event management, because we do the same thing for, uh, for for individual sports as we do for team sports, that's really the core of our business, uh, and it really addresses the first pillar of our strategy, which is uh, of our mission, excuse me, which is to grow participation. Uh, and the easier you make it for you know kids to register or kids parents to register their kids, uh, and the, and the easier you make it for coaches and administrators to to, to get out on the field or the court or the ice with the athletes and spend less time monkeying around with paper and collecting, you know, monies and posting schedules, the, the better the experience is for, for all involved. I mean, I'm so literally, that as core, Oh, sorry. Yeah. Please, I mean, I'm, I'm literally doing that as we speak. I've got a six year old who is signed up for a local soccer league and the back and forth to actually get this thing correct and signed up and practice schedules and money for cleats and shirts and dues it is a rigmarole. I never thought of it before, but it is. Yeah, and uh, and the the marketplace is you know largely led by Stack is consolidating at a rapid pace, uh, and you've got you know a whole bunch of homegrown mom and pop solutions out there. Certainly, you had a lot more of them three or four years ago than you have today, uh, and a lot of them are not user friendly. They're inefficient, so. You know, Stack Sports was founded on the premise of 
hey, this experience has got to be better for parents. It's got to be better for, for coaches and administrators. And, you know, what can we do to simplify the process to, to give the opportunity to get out onto the field onto the field faster. But yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. And, you know, we're very, and we'll talk a little bit, I'm sure about our partnership with Dix, but, you know, marrying that registration process with a, with a purchase occasion, oftentimes at discounted rates for, for the types of gear that you need to, to participate in your sport of choice, you know, the closer you can, you can bring those two purchase occasions together, the better it is for the consumer. Was this out of personal experience for you, or or was just this something that kind of came across your radar that you saw a problem that you felt needed to be fixed? So it was a personal experience for our founder, uh, a gentleman named Rob Wexler, was signing up his kid for, uh, I believe it was for football, and you know he was going through a process. It was cumbersome. Uh, he was a he was a payments guy by by trade, so he, he recognized kind of the inefficient movement of monies, and uh, he did a little bit of research and realized how fragmented the marketplace was, and and it was that personal experience that led to the founding of the business and ultimately the the purchase of all the companies that now comprise Stack Sports. I joined the company about a year and a half into its existence, uh, more as a professional manager coming from software, coming from a software industry that was also highly fragmented and coming from an experience base where I had done a lot of M&A and M&A integration before. Uh, but, you know, like, like the hair club for men commercials, I'm also a, I'm also a client. <laughs> I got, you know, I, I'm a lifetime athlete. I got two young boys as we, as we discussed in the pre in the, before we got online here, uh, and you know they're as as Texas kids are, they're heavily overprogrammed in sports. So I'm a user of, you know, many of my own applications, and you know, unfortunately, some of my competitors as well. I'll get back into all the sports in a moment, but it does sound like there's applications here for what you're doing for a bunch of other sectors, not just sports leagues. I mean, there's dance leagues, there's art leagues, there's theater leagues, there's all sorts of things that are out there. Is that kind of the direction you guys see thing seeing things going? Absolutely. And, you know, we recently we've made a pretty big push into, you know, I would if you had a if you had a cheer or a dance mom in the room, you'd never call it a secondary sport or you might not make it out of the room alive. Uh, but we have we've we've started to focus on other sports of prominence. We recently did a significant deal with USA Cheer. Uh, and you know, cheerleading is uh, obviously it's a it's a sport. It's highly skilled. You know, we're working with college, we're working with high school cheerleaders that are looking to to matriculate into college and become college cheerleaders, and helping them pave a path uh, and connect with with recruiters on the college side. Uh, we you know another sport that you wouldn't necessarily think of is you know is rowing. We own a business called Regatta Central which is the preeminent uh, registration league and event management platform for rowing. We, we handle the vast majority of rowing events in the U.S. and a number outside the U.S. So we're not, we're not just thinking about soccer, football, basketball, you know, their traditional big six. Uh, we're looking at anything that gets people and specifically kids, you know, off the couch and, and onto the field, into the gym, onto the ice, uh, and and we see a lot of opportunity in in some of the some of the other less traditional or, or non mainstream sports. Oh, so some of this is really mission oriented, right? You you want to get activity going. Yeah, and I'll you know we, we're we're steadfast in our mission uh, here at Stack Sports, and it's threefold: it's grow participation, simplify administration, and develop athletes. Uh, and put put simpler, you know, get them onto the field. Uh, give them more time with their with their coach uh, and and take away some of the administrative burden and then and then help them to become you know better athletes and and rise to whatever level they want to rise to uh, which really you know not to, to circle back to our initial discussion but if you think about that bullseye if, if you think about those registration league and event management software assets as the core we've then surrounded that core with other other software assets and operating assets that help athletes get better at their particular craft, whether it's uh, Captain U, which is a recruiting platform that connects high school athletes with college coaches, 
or Global Aptitude, which is basically a digital game planning and video training application that, that athletes use to help uh, prepare for games uh, and get better. We operate a number of entry level all the way up to the most elite uh, camps and combines uh, across a number of sports to help athletes improve. So, you know, we want them, we want them participating, but then to the extent they want to want to get better and improve, we want to have, we want to have products and services that help them do that as well. Um, you mentioned the recruitment tool. I wanted to get into that with you for a moment. Can you kind of describe how that works from the user experience to what is the goal here, which is probably to get a scholarship and play somewhere? Yeah, the the goal for Captain U is simple. It's to help high school athletes make college teams. Uh, and the best the best way to think of it uh, is to use an analogy from the business world is it's the LinkedIn of of college recruiting for high school athletes. We uh, we basically we we find ways to to you know digitally and through events to identify competitive college athletes uh, that, you know, may or may not have an interest in, in competing at the collegiate levels. Uh, and then we, we enroll them in our, in our software application with a free profile. Uh, and, uh, and they, they can upload content. They can upload, you know, videos and sports clips and, and profiles and pictures and grades uh, and then we we basically facilitate uh, an interaction with college coaches who are interested in you know kids of a of a certain profile for certain sports and uh, and we try to facilitate that connection and ultimately help that kid make make a college team. Um, are you seeing a lot of success with that? Absolutely. I, I wish I had the number offhand, but you know the number of kids that flowed through our ecosystem last year that ended up. Uh, enrolling and and making a college team was in the thousands. We huh. have tens of thousands of uh, of subscribers. We have hundreds of thousands of athletes who have who have created profiles. Uh, and you know we think it's a great way to help. You know, like like any of these networking applications to help uh, help high school athletes, you know, find the, the college and the coach of their choice and, and give them a chance to showcase their, their capabilities, both athletic and academic, in a, in, a, in a much more efficient way. The reason why we're talking to you today w- was the recent news with your company, which is you acquired Affinity Sports and Blue Sombrero. So they do what for you? They add a significant uh, footprint of <clears throat> national governing bodies, uh, state sport associations, clubs, and leagues to an already large footprint. So, uh, you remember me in the in the opening comments talking about that bullseye around uh, registration and league management, uh, and they have a significant footprint in registration and league management. Um, so, they bring to to our ecosystem, you know, over 10,000 clubs and leagues across all sports. They bring, you know, close to 50 national governing bodies of sport. Uh, They bring deep relationships with the likes of Little League Baseball, Pony, Pop Warner, uh, um, American Youth Soccer, uh, U.S. Youth Soccer. We have a relationship already with U.S. Soccer Federation. Uh, Together, we now have close to, you know, the majority of the of the youth state soccer association. So it is a direct complement to what we're already doing. What, el- what what they also bring us is a great team and a great culture. And you know, when you do M and A as much as we have, you know, in some cases you're buying customers, in some cases you're buying tech, in some cases you're buying team. I feel like with this with this particular acquisition, we got all of the above in spades, and we got great technology, we got a great team. We got a large customer base, and we're looking forward to uh, to serving them, uh, you know, in a in a high quality way, like they've been served, but also to to expand the types of value that we can bring to them. Um, and you had mentioned Dick Sporting Goods earlier. Um, I want to get to that relationship here for a moment as well. Obviously, if you are helping streamline signups of registrations around the country, all of these people need equipment. So it seems like a natural partnership that you would work with somebody of that level. So can you kind of describe what that relationship is? Yeah, and to be clear, we acquired these software assets from the exporting goods. Yeah. Uh, 
they had, they had entered the, this business initially, I think, in 2012, and then they bought a second business uh, around 2016. And, uh, and, and Dix is a fantastic company, but there's a, there's a big difference between operating a software company and operating, operating a sporting goods retailer. <clears throat> I think they did a great job with these assets. Uh, but you know, our in our extensive discussions with Dix, you know, we we said, hey, we are a software company. Uh, that's all we do, uh, and specifically, we're a sports software company, sports software and payments. You know, let us do what we do best, and and let's have you do what you do best on the on the retail operating side. So that was really the catalyst. Which is, you know, can you take, you know, the 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 things that each of us do best. You know, put them together in a way that we can have a long-term, healthy partnership. Uh, and and I'm thrilled that we were able to, you know, to reach the finish line on the deal to acquire the the software assets from Dix, but also, you know, at the same time enter into a long-term retail partnership where we can, as I mentioned earlier, take that take that sporting goods purchase occasion uh, and really tailor it to you know the athlete or the parent and and get it closer to you know, the time when they, when they need the gear. So we're looking forward to working uh, with, with Dick Sporting Goods to, to, you know, target the consumers that are in our ecosystem, to target them with high value offers uh, at the right time in the right place. Uh, and, and, you know, for what it's worth, you know, Dix uh, has a very similar mission to, to, to stack sports. They're all about uh, participation in sports. They're all about, Youth participation in sports. Uh, they've got a foundation called Sports Matter, uh, which is again just a uh, you know a way for them to promote what they think is something that creates positive impacts on the lives of of, of kids and parents and society. And I think having that uh, having a common mission with what with what Dix is about made this made this deal uh, happen and made the the long term partnership attractive for both parties. I should also mention that in addition to Dix being a retail partner for, for Stack, that Stack is also the official uh, league management software provider for Dix Sporting Goods. So just like we would be promoting their, their retail offerings, they are actively promoting our software solutions in their ecosystem. And in many cases, they'll retain relationships directly with many of the national governing bodies that we serve from a software perspective. Um, I'll, I'll let you go with this because there's a lot, it seems, going on here um, and, and all of it kind of converging here. It feels, I mean, maybe in just in this conversation, it feels like it's all kind of converging at the same time. So you have a lot of things going on. Um, what's the ultimate goal for the company? Yeah, there is a lot going on. Uh, and there's still a lot of, uh, there has been a lot of consolidation in the industry. Uh, and I'd say the ultimate goal for the company is, uh, to, to serve as many sports organizations and athletes as possible uh, and, and to start to weave together the different components of technology uh, in a way that, that you know, makes it easier to administer, allows for more time on the field, uh, and allows you know, kids and adults to get better. You know, there are a lot of software solutions that serve the athletic space most of them uh, don't talk to each other. And we found that if you can eliminate the friction between, uh, let me give you an example, between you know, registering for a sport and, uh, and communicating with the, you know, the different parents on the team or signing up for a tournament or you know, enrolling in a camp or you know, taking, you know, taking, uh, taking roster information and having it pushed to a scheduling app, all that stuff today in the marketplace has friction uh, because you've got different providers that are that have kind of carved out little segments of the market. We're bringing together a platform of solutions that reduces that friction, uh, and and ultimately we want to be and believe that we will be the solution in the marketplace that that teams, clubs, leagues, national governing bodies rely on to. To administer their, you know, their their organizations, uh, and and the more that they can, the more of our solutions that they can use, the less friction they're going to have trying to piece together other solutions in the marketplace. But again, for us, it all gets back to, you know, how many how many athletes are we helping get out on the field, and how are we helping them get better and spend more time, you know, practicing and playing, and and less time shuffling paper or delivering checks or, uh, or, you know, working with inefficient software tools.
Is this happening outside of the United States? Are you guys global doing this? It is happening outside of the United States. We are global. Uh, we're the only player that's doing this on an international scale. Uh, since you know my, my tenure here, our focus has been disproportionately on North America. But we have a, a Melbourne, Australia-based business that does exactly what we've been talking about in Australia, New Zealand, in the UK. We think that you know the the global play here, the international play, is a is a huge opportunity for Stack Sports, but. You know, as, and I, can, I know you've read up on the business. We've done a, a heck of a lot in a short period of time, and we want to make sure we get it right, uh, right here in in North America first. Um, but we think there's a tremendous opportunity to expand that footprint. And I'll say that you know that there's some some features and capabilities in the in the assets that we just acquired from Dix and Blue Sombrero and Affinity that I think will accelerate our ability to, to, to expand our footprint into new international markets. And these are capabilities that some of our existing applications didn't have. So I'm excited about the international prospects, but it's a, it's a big market. It's, it's complex. Uh, great news is we have an underlying payments platform that, that's already basically tuned to go anywhere in the world. We just have to ensure that the software that sits on top of that platform is, is also ready for for other languages uh, and and the style in which they administer their sports. Alex Alt is the CEO of Stack Sports. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Bram. Have a great day. That will do it for us this week. Remember, the future is now. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. The Future Sport Podcast is brought to you by 3Advance, developers of sports tech apps that are AI-powered and UX-focused. So if you're looking to create some apps for your startup or your sports biz calls for some artificial or business intelligence, you should check out 3Advance. They're incredible. Go to 3Advance.com. That's the number 3Advance.com.